Hey everyone, and welcome to Get Your Hopes Up. I'm Christy Wright, and I'm so glad you're here. Romans 15, 13 says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him, so that you may overflow with hope by power of the Holy Spirit. Our God is the God of hope, and He wants you to overflow with hope. So let's start our week by getting our hopes up again. Now today, we have a really special episode of the Get Your Hopes Up podcast because today, for the first time ever, we have a guest. Y'all, I have been wanting to start having guests on this show for quite a while. But of course, there's logistics and scheduling and editing and all the good things. And today, we are kicking it off with my very good friend, Kim Jones. Let me tell you about Kim. She is a pastor, but you probably know her most commonly and most famously as Real Talk Kim. I remember starting to follow her years ago on Instagram, and I loved how sassy she was, how direct, how intense, how truth-telling, straight-shooting that she is, and how much she loves Jesus. She unapologetically will tell you the truth, shoot you straight, and you know we all need a friend like that. She also has an incredible story of overcoming, y'all. Sometimes I think we see people like Kim on Instagram, like, well, gosh, her, her makeup is so great and her confidence is so strong. She probably never had to deal with anything. It's the exact opposite. She has an incredible story of what she's been through and how she has found God and found strength through this journey. And she's going to share it with us today. Let me tell you a little bit about her first. Pastor Kimberly Jones, known as Real Talk Kim, travels the world fulfilling her passion and purpose of loving people back to life. She is a mother, pastor, entrepreneur, mentor, motivational speaker, entertainer, and best-selling author. She is a force to be reckoned with, and I'm so happy to call her my friend. Here is my conversation with Real Talk Kim. All right, let's dive in. Kim, Yes. listen, I am so excited about this conversation because like I just said, I have been a fan of yours for years. I've shared your stuff. One of the things I love about you, I'm willing to bet, is what everyone loves about you. And that is that you are so real. It is your handle on Instagram, Real Talk Kim. You're you're unapologetic in sharing the truth. But I just want to start with a little bit of your story because I think it's somewhat it's easy for someone to look at someone like you that is cute and confident with your cute hat and your cute makeup and you got millions of followers and go well yeah it's easy to be confident if i had what you have but you didn't wake up here so would you take us back because i even learned a lot about your story even through your devotional in your book of things you went through take us back to some of those early days some of the heartbreak moments where maybe you even lost your faith a little bit you were burnt out, you were tired, you were brokenhearted, you got divorced. Tell us a little bit about your some of those early days of your story so we can see how this really began for you. Well, you know, I was raised, my daddy's a preacher, and so we traveled. I, I was born in North Carolina, and we were on the road two days later traveling, evangelizing. And so I was raised on the church pew. But the religion that that we were raised in, I'm so thankful for it. Like, I'm just so thankful. I'm at a place in my life at 51 years old where I'm just so thankful for all of the dips. I'm thankful for all the mess that I went through. But I'm really thankful that I was raised uh, learning about God. I was, I, I didn't always embrace him. Um, women couldn't preach in this religion. It was us four and no more. Like it's one of those, if you don't, if you don't think like we do dress like we do, then you're not going to heaven. And I just really, at a very young age, I can remember, um, I'm starting in kindergarten. I was in special ed, had to leave class, go get special help. And so as I look back, especially when I got 36, when I turned 36, I remember, My marriage ended after 18 years of us fighting, two preacher's kids getting together. And that's when I really had to start looking back over my life and looking at my patterns. I had to realize that I was a runner. I had to realize that I would go against the grain. And if you told me I couldn't do anything, that's exactly what I was going to (laughs) do. And I was really, I really was looking at God like he was a mean God because every time I would ever be in the prayer room with my mother, uh, she would immediately start weeping and her nose would turn red and she would be snotting. And I was like, man, God, you are really mean. Like, 
<laughs> has to cry like this. And then right. I embraced all these religious people that were judgmental and looked miserable. And I look back over that healing process at 36. I had to move back in with my mother and my daddy with my two sons. I was so broken, so devastated. The only one in my family that couldn't keep a marriage. My mother and dad had been married at that point 40 years. And my brother and his wife were successful. And here I am literally walking out something that I couldn't even fathom. Like I could not even fathom. I'm not going to be married. Like I've wasted, because that's the first thing we do when something doesn't right, work. Right. Wasted 18 years. I wasted 40 years only to walk through a divorce. And in that process, I remember about six months in, um, I finally got to a place where I stopped yelling at God and being mad at God. And I mean, angry that all of these people could talk about me when they didn't live in my shoes. All these people could judge me, then me judge myself. And then when I walk out of this divorce, I had to go get a job at Belk, which is like a Kmart on crack, right. <laughs> like $9 an hour. And it was until about the seventh, sixth, seventh month. I'm laying in my bed one day and it was probably the first time, Christy, that I heard God for me. Mm, I'm okay. going to every Bible school camp. Every year we went to, the, my parents sent me to this camp. Everybody, you know, we had that night where everybody got the Holy Ghost and all my friends, oh, yeah. I just got the Holy Ghost. And I'm like, I didn't get the Holy Ghost. Like, <laughs> I, got, I didn't get the Holy Ghost. And so it was like all my life. It was like the enemy was setting me up to, you're not good enough. You're not worthy. Uh, you're too much. Uh, you're, you're, you, you, you're not accountable. You're, and all the things was correct. Like literally right. when I'm laying in my bed that night, I, I'm praying and I said, God, take this pain away from me. And I heard God for the first time in my spirit. I was thinking he was going to be like, Kimberly. <laughs> That's what I thought my whole life was right. going to be like, talk audible to me. And right. so, in that moment, because of my brokenness, it was like beautifully broken is where God did his best work in me. I'm desperate. I can't buy cheese with my credit. I lost everything. I got two sons that need their mama and their daddy and neither one are present because I'm sitting here crying over a pain that I might not necessarily have caused, but that pain and healing was my responsibility. Right. Like that night, girl, it was like God began to just drop in my spirit. I cried so hard that night. It was just me and God in that room. And it was like, I said, God, take this pain away from me. And I heard in my spirit, like, a, like something sat on my chest. I can't take it away. You got to get up and walk away from it. Mm. Oh, and oh. I realized in that moment, the pain may not be my fault, but the healing is my responsibility. And I cannot go through life bleeding on people that didn't cut me. And girl, I cr the joints of my fingers ached that night. I was, I, it was like, like literally for the first time in my life, I realized I was the common denominator. I was the one that always rebelled. I was the one that always made choices without praying and asking God if this was the right way. I was the one trying to prove a point that women were as good as men. I was the one trying to make people become my savior when God was really the foundation. He let me hit rock bottom to find the rock out, find the rock at the bottom, which was him. And that night things began to change, Christy. I, I literally, I got a job, a transfer over to, to Bloomingdale's in Estee Lauder. And I had one hour going to work and one hour coming home. And I would literally spend that hour with podcast in my ears, like get your hopes up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in my ears. I didn't listen to music. I listened to people that could pour into me. It was like I had free college. Yeah. Or, yeah. And I began to change. I literally began to pick my life up. And I, I got free from what people thought about me. I was intentional. I would lay in my bed every night and say, God, help me forgive. I don't know how. I know praying for my ex to get killed with the train is not right. Right, right, right. <laughs> I, know that I do right. know that much. Yes. But I need you to get me at my heart right. And I prayed it every day until all of a sudden I was realizing, oh, my gosh, I'm not angry anymore. I would pray for joy. God, I want joy. I know it's a fruit of the spirit. I don't want to be driven by my emotions. I don't want to bleed. I don't want to, I don't want to walk through life miserable. I want to find you. And in that process, I began to fall in love with Kim. Mm. And I found my voice. 
Yeah. It's so interesting too, because I think one of the things that's so amazing about your transformation is there's such a strong component of personal responsibility. And a lot of people could go through what you went through and they still have that resentment decades later. They're still blaming other people. They're bitter. They're, you don't know how hard I've had it. Well, you don't know what happened. All of that may be true. There may be intense trauma. There may be heartbreak. There may be injustice. All of that may be true. But what I love about your devotional, specifically the, the title, Unstuck, so many people get stuck there. Yeah. They get stuck there and they're still blaming people. And you talk a lot about this all throughout your book, all throughout your devotional. And it's such a, a pattern in what you preach. It's such a strong theme of personal responsibility and you healing, you picking yourself up, even you choosing to do something tactical, like put in your mind podcasts and sermons instead of listening to music. And that truly transformed your mind. I, you know, I've uh, Jenny Allen's book, Get Out of Your Head, she quotes that we have up to 60,000 thoughts a day, up to 80% of those are negative. So if that is true, then we've got to counteract that with what we put in. And many people aren't, but you are. And, and you're seeing the fruit of that days later and decades later of what you're putting in your mind to renew it. So one of the things that I love, you, you talk about this in your uh, uh, blurb, your description of your devotional, it says, get unstuck from regrets, shame, and broken dreams. And this is something I want to spend some time with you on because I want to dig into how. For people that haven't had that Holy Spirit night like you had, how do they get unstuck? Because we know that habits are strong, thinking patterns are strong. Sometimes it's not an overnight switch. And even for you, I'm sure it wasn't overnight. You may have turned that day, but it took time to, and you even talk about this, to unlearn some of those habits. And the the heart behind this podcast, and many people have heard my story that follow me, but so often we say these very adult-like things like, well, I don't want to get my hopes up. I'll believe it when I see it. I'm not a pessimist. I'm a realist. And all of these statements that sound very mature, very wise, very reasoned and practical and measured. And the truth is, it's the exact opposite of faith. God never says, could you please be more practical? Could you please be more logical? Please, I need you to dial this in a little bit more to the natural. He doesn't say that. And so I deliberately, I'm an Enneagram 8, if you're familiar with Enneagram, and I go straight into conflict like you, I'm sure. So I'm like, oh, everyone's telling me I can't name this podcast, Get Your Hopes Up, which I had multiple people tell me not to name it this. I said, that's exactly what this is going to be named. It's going to be named Get Your Hopes Up because that's what God says. He is the God of hope. And it's based on Romans 15, 13, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. So you may overflow with hope by power of the Holy Spirit. So for you, how do you get out of those? How did you get out of those old thinking patterns for people that are like, yeah, Kim, I want to do that, but I haven't had this Holy Spirit night where God spoke to me and I just fall back into the same patterns. I, I harbor resentment. I don't speak up and then I'm mad at myself. I'm bitter. I'm angry in my heart. How do we unlearn those habits and change to take that responsibility you're talking about? You know, for me, I, I got me a journal. And in this journal, I literally write. In fact, if you follow me anywhere on any of my social platforms, I got a challenge every month for everybody. And I believe Habakkuk 2. It says, write the vision, make it plain. Well, for me, I couldn't heal what I wouldn't reveal. And I had to realize at the end of the day that I can't change anybody. The only time you can change someone is their diaper when they're a baby. The only thing that you can really change is you. And you finally get sick and tired of being sick and tired. You begin to change things. I, I, when you were saying that, I don't expect anything from anyone because I don't get disappointed when I don't expect. That all goes against what God says. A thousand percent. It's such a hopeless way to live. And really, it's all stemmed from the rejection that we have encountered. And if the enemy cannot take you out, and he can't, he wears you out with these kind of feelings. I've had a whole lot of brokenness in my life. I'm never going to get married. I've been married five times. I feel like the woman at the well. I'm never going to find someone to love me. So what he does is he picks away at your hope. When the Bible says hope deferred makes the heart weak, it's the truth. At the end of the day, when you can look at yourself, and I always say, you, you said I have a, a big uh, a holding ourselves accountable. It's the truth. Because even though you, that, that what that person did to you when they had that affair, or they betrayed you, wasn't your fault. You steal something inside of you. It's the law of draw. You're the one that keeps getting into relationships with people that are what you think you deserve instead of what you want, right? Because we 
don't feel worthy. So what I did was I took a journal and in that journal, I would write down things that I want to change. I would write down, like, I am, why do I always, and I prayed these prayers. I was like, God, because you ain't got to pray good prayers. You just pray prayers like, man, I am ratchet. But I <laughs> Help me. Yeah, show me the ratchet areas of my life, God. <laughs> he gives them that first thing that starts dropping in your spirit, you start writing it down. And so the more you see the things that God is exposing, like, God, I want to forgive, but I don't know how. I wrote that on top of the page. And then after I got done praying that, I prayed all throughout the day under my breath while I'm at work. I would write down what dropped in my spirit. Like, what am I, what am I holding on to? Because a lot of times, because we're, we're so big adulting and, and, and we can't grieve because our kids are watching or we can't have bad days because we are a single parent, whatever it is in those moments, you got to take 15 minutes every day to spend time. If you ain't got 15 minutes, you sit on the bathroom toilet at least 15 minutes. <laughs> Or five minutes. That's women, two minutes. But <laughs> two minutes to take your phone out and, and write something that has dropped in your spirit that day. And then you got to celebrate your wins. Celebrate the fact that you didn't stalk that person on social media that day. Celebrate the fact that you shut that person down in that conversation when they were trying to tell you about what somebody said about you. Celebrate the fact that you all of a sudden got a quicken in your spirit that when you put that messy post up and all those people came underneath condoning your bad behavior, you were like, oh, you ain't good for my future because you're going to enable me to stay in this dysfunction. So celebrate the small wins. Celebrate that you got up out of bed that day and you fixed your hair. Celebrate the fact that you didn't wish a train would hit your ex that day. Celebrate that. Quit stalking them. Quit going and hurting your heart over and over again. And then when you have a bad day, don't quit. Get back up again. The Bible says grace and mercy shall follow you all the days of your life. You know what? You can start out by just saying, Lord, give me. I remember, Christy, when I was going through my healing process and I was like, I had uh, found this this quiz on social media and it was like 25 things that I love about me or that about me. And I was like, people are telling you they like tomato sam tomato sandwiches with mayonnaise and pepper and their favorite color was magenta. And I was like, oh, I'm going to do this, this quiz. And I went to number one and it was like, what's your favorite color? I didn't know what my favorite color was. I'd lost myself. I knew what my favorite food was. I broke down again and started crying. Oh my God, I've lost me because uh, I'm so dramatic. And <laughs> Listen to me. All I said was, God, and I wrote it. I wrote it. God, help me know 25 things about me that you created that was very good. Because when you created me, you said, This is very good. And girl, seven days later, this is why y'all got to talk to God for starters. Listen to me, especially if you're hopeless. I said, God, give me 25 things. Do you know, seven days later, Christy, it was Mother's Day. And my youngest son, Lincoln Presley, comes and hands me a point. And it says 35 things that I love about Oh, you're going to make me tear up. Christy. Beautiful. I bald. 100%. Because 100%. I'm looking at this kid that I felt, look, I'm tearing up too. I'm looking at this kid that's at nine years old that his brother is handling the divorce totally different. His brother's angry. Lincoln's clingy but very, very creative. And he had it in a dress. I don't even know how he did it. I've got the poem to this day. It was done in a dress, like a lady with a dress and 35 things made the person. And number one said, I love you, mama, because you were the loudest one at my basketball games. Now this joker for his whole childhood life, Christy, would say on the way to his games, if you yell today, Mom, <laughs> I am not going to ever tell you again when there's a basketball game because you embarrass me. And of course, I'm like, wow, that boy loved it. And he told me because I was told all my life, you're too much. And then number six was another one that was, all of them were unbelievable. But number six said, Mama, you conquered hell in high heels. Girl, it meant, Mama, 
you don't realize, you think that divorce took you off the, cl- the couture rack and put you on the clearance rack. But you did this thing with grace. And I'm really proud of you, mama. My point is when you stop focusing on all the bad and you stop focusing on how far you got to go and you thank God for how far you've come and you start saying, I'm not going to look like my past, but my future. And you talk to God about what you need. He already knows. He already got it planned out, but he's a gentleman. He's not going to force it on you. Well, lay it out. That boy named my first ministry, Conquering Hell in High Heels. Wow. Helping women all over the world. My point is, get your butt up and realize that when you were born, that God created you as a special couture piece of human. And there's nobody else on this planet that can do it like you. And so the enemy's job is to kill, steal, and destroy. And he does it through you. He does it through your mind. And today, you've got to shake that mess off of you. You are not stuck because you're not a tree. You're stuck because you stopped in a place that caused you a lot of pain. But that pain has a purpose. Kim, you said so many things I want to go back to. First of all, 35 things. Isn't that just like God where you said, Lord, Show me 25 things. And he said, I'm going to give you 10 more. I can't tell you how many times in my life I prayed for something. And God says more, I'm going to get, ask for more. And I'm going to still give you more than that. And I just, I love, cause it's the goodness of God in that poem. And it's the beauty of your son. There's layers and layers and layers of love and beauty in that moment. And only God could orchestrate that. You said something, you said two things that I want to go back to. You said so many good things. One of them is you just keep saying, God, help me. God, you said it a minute ago, God, help me forgive. God, help me see where I'm ratchet. God, help me, you know, whatever, whatever the thing is. And I love that very simple reminder that I want our listeners to hear. If there's something you don't know how to do, ask God for help. He doesn't expect you to know how to do everything. He's not pointing his finger going, man, I wish you were like your older sister, man. I wish you did better. He's going, I will help you. There was a day, um, Kim, last year, God, so after leaving Ramsey after 12 years, which was one of the scariest things I've ever done in my life, walked away from all my books, all my, my relationships, everything. I, God took me into this wilderness and it was, you know, he'll, he will draw you into the wilderness and speak to you. And that wilderness was full of testing, full of testing, test after test after test. When I thought, God, I can't take it anymore. He said, we're going to go further. And it was like, it was, he was undoing a lot in me. There was one particular day and I'm for sure going to cry when I say this, but there was one particular day where he had, our bank account had just gone down, 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 right? Because it's like, I I hadn't started my business yet. I'd left everything. We're living on savings. And God is telling me, as I'm watching it go down, letting him know, hey, do you see what's happening here? Because we got three little kids, special needs kids, expensive schools, God, do you see? And he had gotten it lower than I ever thought it could ever get with our expenses. And he had asked me to give. In In the, when you're going, I don't even have it to give. And I remember getting on my face, Kim, getting on my face, on my carpet, in my house. And I said, God, help me, help me. And the very next day, my friend sent me a devotional that said, I will help you. That was the scripture. I will help you. He will speak to you and he will help you. And so I love how you say that because for our listeners that are going, I don't know how to get unstuck. I don't know how to pray. I don't know how to forgive. I don't know how to get rid of bitterness. I don't know how to not scream at mask. Okay, (laughs) God, help me. God will, whatever the thing is, He cares about those details because he cares about you. So I just love your posture of constantly asking for help. But you said something else I want to go back to because I want to camp here for a minute. You said, I couldn't heal what I wouldn't reveal. And I actually just had this conversation with my son a couple of days ago because my son, is he's nine years old, my oldest. He's in a real stage of arguing, Kim. Real (laughs) stage of just every, the sky's blue. No, it's not. It's green. (laughs) Carter, please put on your shoes. I don't need shoes. I don't, I mean, he could, that child can argue all day. So there was one specific thing where he has a problem and he would rather argue about it than face it. And I said to him the other day, this was literally two days ago. I said, Carter, I said, if you have a problem, I can help you if we can agree that this is a problem. Hey mom, I don't know how to do this thing. Hey, I'll help you do this thing. But if you're in denial that there's a problem, if you refuse to acknowledge there's a problem, I can't help you, man. I can't help you because we're both looking at the same situation and I'm going, this is a problem. You're going, it's not a problem. I can't help you there. 
I love what you said. I couldn't heal what I wouldn't reveal. I'm willing to bet there's a lot of listeners that are either in denial that there's a problem, in denial that they have personal responsibility to take, in denial that they have bitterness, or they know it's there, but they'd rather just bury their head in the sand. They don't want to face it. And one of the things I said of you as we prayed before we started recording, I said, you're so courageous because it takes courage to face that mess. It takes courage to pray to pair and go, God, show me where I'm ratchet. Because he will, man. He will. He'll show you. And you're, Whoa, what? that's hard to face sometimes. Tell me a little bit about how you have the courage to face this stuff. Because I want our listeners to pray those exact prayers where they say, God, show me what is mine to own. Show me where I need to take responsibility. Show me where I need to forgive. And that takes a lot of courage because so many people don't want to face it. Help them, help them face that so that they can reveal it and heal from it. Well, you know, life is... In the word of God, it says the rain falls on the just and the unjust, which means we're going to go through life. And it is up to us to realize that God is a God of peace, not of chaos and confusion. And so a lot of times God will show you you're going the wrong direction or you've got a pattern here by the agitation. He'll give you agitation in the circumstance. He'll almost force you there. I was a type of person that would just, if I don't acknowledge it, it doesn't exist. I would stick my head in the sand and I was that way with phone calls. I was that way with handling creditors. I was that way with doctors. I was that way with me. And I would just not want to address it because I didn't, it felt too big. It felt so large that I had so far to go because I had done so much and so many things that happened in my life. I couldn't even fathom. There was nobody in my life that had ever encountered what I went through to show me the path. There was no book on -on one-on-one how to reveal and heal. So what I did was I became like the, like a kid's picture Bible. That's a good example where they, that, that, that when you're teaching your children about God, they'll show you pictures of, of Noah with the big ark. And, and I began to pray for God to give me a simplicity. Like God, allow me to not look at this like it's so hard because I don't want to stay here. Basically, I got sick and tired of being sick and tired. And I started allowing myself to realize you don't take out Rome at once. It's one step at a time. You're not going to fix that pain that you were birthed in because your whole family was dysfunctional by just one day deciding you don't want to do that. That addiction is just probably going to be every day you telling that cigarette, I'm not going to buy you today and put it in my house. That high blood pressure or the sugar diabetes, I can't just fix it. But one ho-ho left in the cabinet at a time is going to help my, it's, 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 it's taking action. And so for me and all of you watching today, you have to start one step at a time. And you have to literally say, this is why I write everything down because I forget. I am excited about life. And so I have to write it down to keep it in front of me. It is literally looking at it like, God, this is not what you created for me. You didn't create me to be in dysfunctional relationships. You did not create me to be angry that I'm a single parent. You did not create me to live sick in my body. And so I need to show me I need you to show me what I need to do and I will help you. And even when I lose something in my house, I will say, Holy Spirit, show me where it's at. I do too all the time. I have ADHD, Kim. I lose things a lot. I'm asking, I'm asking the Holy Spirit multiple times a day. God, where's that? Where's those keys? Where's that phone? God, help me out. I absolutely find it. Do I find it on the spot? No. Like last week, I lost some keys. It it took me two weeks. And I found it, but it was like, God was saying, are you going to keep trusting me? Because it's always a test. And if you don't pass the test, you're going to take the test over again. You're going to take it again. Sure are. Sure. Yes. Are. So it's every day allowing Holy Spirit to assist you. And if you never had an encounter with God, that's why you don't. We will follow ways. We will put this app. Ways in our phone. I know how to get from Buckhead to Fayetteville, Georgia, my church with my eyes closed. But every time I leave my Buckhead home, I put it in my ways because Ways knows how to tell me if there's a cop, if there's a a car on the side. I'm trusting that thing over all them sketchy back roads to get me through the traffic. But I won't talk to the Holy Spirit. I won't talk to the one who created me because I've never had an experience with him or I've seen him. I haven't seen him. I haven't, he can't, I can't put my arms around him. It's in this season of vulnerability. It's saying, you know what? 
This is how I did it. God, I can do anything for 30 days. My commitment to you, God, is I'm not going to pick up a text from that person that I know needs to be out of my life. I'm going to go no contact. I'm going to get all the ho-hos out of my house to see if I can lose 30 pounds in a month. I'm going to get my mind right. I'm not going to Netflix and chill. I'm going to get them apps off my phone and streaming. And I'm going to find some voices that you've sent into my life that's going to help me resurrect these dead, dry bones. Because once I received Jesus as my personal savior, all old things have passed away and he's made things new in my life, which means I got the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. It's so funny too, because I think so often we want to make it more complicated than that more complicated than Netflix and Ho-Ho's, because if we make it more complicated in our mind, we've got excuses of why we can't do it. And so instead we overcomplicate it and go, well, I can't do it because of all these scenarios. It is that simple. It is as simple as waking up and praying. It's as simple as journaling. One of the things, one of the things you talk about, and you, you talk about this in day 36 of your new devotional that we're talking about here, and you talk about taking back your power. And specifically renewing your thoughts. You put a sentence in there that was just so good. You said, you are today where your thoughts have brought you. And that is so powerful because I think we have, well, we do have so much more control over our thoughts than we realize. But often we feel victim to them or we're unaware of the power they have over us. The enemy can get in there and plant seeds and lies and we believe them. And we even think they're serving us. So, um, you know, I'm thinking of someone right now that, She's going through a hard time and she's bitter. She's really, really bitter. And and I'm willing to bet the enemy's like, yeah, and you're so wronged. And they did that and they did that. And you're so, the, and just, and you just sulk and you've got a pity party and you build this case against those people. And what's so interesting is we choose to have those thoughts. We choose. They're moving on. Those thoughts are not serving us whatsoever. They don't feel good. And we see in scripture time and time and time again, God will not coddle our insecurities. He will not join our pity party and go, yeah, you're right. You're having a hard time. Where's the the Cheetos? Let's get some Netflix and chill because this is just a bad. No, he will immediately show you the speck, the plank in your own eye. He will show you that. So talk to me a little bit about the power that we have if we're willing to take it back, just like you talk about day 36, our thoughts have power and we have power over our thoughts. If we choose to take it back, how do we do this practically? How do we even catch them, Kim? How do we catch them and go, oh, that's, wait a minute, that's not good. Cause sometimes it's sneaky. Like the enemy can sneak in there and we don't even realize we're doing it. You know, for me, and I, I'm on prayer call every single morning, yelling at everybody, like, listen to me, y'all, you are, they're moving on. That rejection wasn't necessarily someone wanting out of your life. It was somebody God needed out of your future. You were being loyal to a lie. I mean, it is literally allowing yourself to deprogram when you are having those anxiety attacks and your chest is closing in and you run to the hospital because you're having a heart attack and they're like, no. And you're like, the, the, my, my, just check my pulse. I can see it pulsating out of my arm right now. And they're like, it's normal. You're like, no, it's not. It is like the enemy makes things so much bigger than they are that we are clouded and we can't see out of it, then what we do is we almost get to a place where we like the attention being broken gets us. Nobody expects anything out of us. And when we've walked through a divorce or we've walked through uh, losing our job or we walk through, you know, a, a, a humbling experience, the first thing we want to do is not let anybody know about it because we don't want them to not approve. The one thing that I learned so much, Christy, was in that process, the one reason I wasn't getting healed is because I cared more about the way I looked to a whole bunch of people that didn't even matter. Mm. And how often do we do that? All the time, not just during divorce, all the time. How often are we doing things with our kids, with our clothes, with our house, with our money, with our any business? Because we are totally making our decision based on what we think other people are going to think about us. And can I tell you something? They're not thinking about you at all. They're not. They're not. It's not that they're not thinking that. They're not thinking about you at all. They're in their own war. <laughs> yes. Yes. That's so good. Every time those thoughts come in my head that are causing me Like I'll even, I'm so good now that if I wake up and all of a sudden I feel like even Sunday at my church, I traveled all weekend and my son works, my two sons work for me, but one of them's Kim Jr. And he was like, I'm going to need you to go take a nap. 
And I'm like, why? And he's like, you're just off today. You're off today. Truth was, I was in the spirit. God was, the anointing was heavy. And, but the thought that he planted out of his sweet little thing, you says, mama being ADHD and with a whole lot of H, I was more somber. I had to allow myself, uh oh, that thought is going to cause me to be thinking about, I need to get out of this. I need to get out of this when it ain't that at all. It is Holy Spirit that I'm, that that God is about to send this church into a healing moment today. And I'm, I'm the, the, the carrier of this thing. So every time now, when a thought is put there of the enemy to distract me, I immediately think, nope, that ain't God. That ain't God. And I will change the thought. This is how you renew your mind, y'all. When something is causing you heaviness, like Christians are the worst at this. Oh, the devil's just fighting me today. I got spiritual warfare. Oh, it's like that is our excuse not to deal with what's really going on. Is it really warfare or is it your choices to stay where you are? Is it really a bad day or was it just really a bad second and you let it turn your mood We are in charge of our emotions and we have to take the E off and keep motion moving. So every time something's put in my head that ain't a God, Christy, I immediately figure it out. But I pray every morning when I get up, God, let me stay in charge. Lord, don't let me be moved by people, emotions. I cancel every plot, every plan, every scheme the enemy's devised against me or anyone connected to me today. It shall not work. I pray that prayer. So now I'm quick. The Holy Spirit's like, that ain't God. That's such a powerful question too. I started asking that question years ago when I would have these thoughts and you start to spiral and I would go, is this what God says about me? And every time it just reveals the enemy's cards. I got to tell you a funny story. This was probably like two weeks ago. I was at our new lake house that the Lord just gave us, which is a whole God story. That's just so cool. And my daughter, I've got a nine-year-old little boy, seven-year-old little boy and a four-year-old daughter. She's as spicy as they come. You better just believe she's like, you know, coming out guns blazing. So all I hear, I don't hear what commotion happened downstairs. All I hear is her in her tiny little blonde curl stomping up the stairs and she whips around, points down the stairs. She goes, that's not true. I'm a good person. (laughs) I don't even know what Conley said, but she stood up for her and said, that's not true. I'm a good person. And I died laughing first of all. And I was like, yeah, girl, you stand up for yourself. And she was like, Conley said, I'm a liar. I'm like, you do lie a lot. So we should work on that. But you stand up for yourself. (laughs) What's so beautiful is we have to do that with the enemy. That's not true. That's not true. I'm a good person. That's not true. I am saved. That's not true. This is what God says. That's not true. I have, um, last year when I was going through this wilderness and I would do all these, you know, all these tests and obedience and stuff. And I would do something. I would say out loud how I felt because I validate how I feel. Like how I feel is like, yeah, this is true. I'm not going to ignore it and stuff it down. It's going to come out sideways. But then I would replace it with the truth. So I would say something like, I feel stupid, but I am not stupid. I feel alone, but I know my God never leaves me. And so just declaring and catching those thoughts, the more you do it, Kim, and I bet this is true for you, the easier and more natural it becomes. The more you do it, you don't have to think, oh, I've got to catch my thoughts. It just becomes a rhythm that you're able to filter them more quickly and you take back that power exactly like you're talking about. And I think that that is so key to getting unstuck because it all starts in our mind. Just like you say, the personal responsibility, it all starts in our mind. I know we got to wrap up in a minute. I want to comment. I want to ask you about another day here. Day 78, you talk about one right decision. And I love this so much because one of the other strategies of the enemy is to get us down, beat us down, kick us while we're down, but keep us down by believing that we're too far gone. We've made too many bad choices. God is mad at us. We are outcasts. We can't be used. Our our story's too broken. We're too far gone. And I just love this example where you talk about the power of one right decision. Can you talk a little bit about even how you've seen that in your life of the fruit and the nearness of God in one right decision, how pleased and how near he is to us in the simple things we're talking about that he does not look at you like the enemy makes you believe that he is disappointed and you're outcast. You're not. It's just simply not true. You know, for me, my right decision, I could think of several, but one of my, a lot of them, my, because I was the queen of wrong decisions, but one of the right decisions that sticks out to me all the time, and I have to practice it every day, and that is with haters. That is with people that know you well, and they only can remember the past, who you are. And 
one thing that I discovered, I had this person that literally was on social media talking about me with the shoes on their feet. I had gotten them and I wanted so bad to defend myself. And I, I, at that moment said, no, I am going to practice what God did with Judah, Judah sitting at that table. And I'm going to just keep preaching the glory, preach on love, preach on forgiveness. And I'm going to take the power away that the enemies want to trip me up with right now. And I'm going to realize that that person has a lot of people that, that have come to Jesus through their, their Facebook page. And if I ever try to tank that person with the truth, then every person that falls away from God, because they were disappointed, their blood's on my hands. And I watched as that one right decision literally created a place of elevation for me because it was like, God showed me at that moment, I got this. Like if you can love before you block a person, you don't just block a person because you hate them. You have to ask your heart, why am I posting this subliminal message? Why am I blocking this person? Is there anger? Is there bitterness? You got to get to the root And one right choice at a time. Love covers a multitude. It's not saying you got to let that person back in your life, but it's saying you're taking the power away that the enemy's trying to create inside of you. You are not becoming like they are to you. You're not allowing that. And that's where the right decisions are in my life every day now. I realize every single time my flesh wants to act out, I do the exact opposite. Yeah, it's so good. Every <laughs> so good. Every time my flesh wants to act out, I just do the exact opposite. I love that. I, I saw a quote on Instagram a long time ago that said, "Drama needs an audience. Take away the audience, and the drama will die out." And I love that so much because we just oh, we want to take the bait. We want to get in there. If you're an Enneagram mate, and you're like, "I want to right the wrong. I want to fix the injustice. I want to have the last word." And it's like, oh, there's such power in silence. And in not reacting, and you take it away, take away the audience, and the drama will die out. Oh my gosh, Kim, I could talk to you all day. You are such a fire. You are just, it's just amazing how it comes out of you so naturally. But I know, I know from living this in my life and watching you and watching others, this is the fruit of decades of one right decision, of small acts of faithfulness, of on your face in prayer when no one is watching. And that's what I want to encourage people. It's not about having a big platform and being a fiery personality. It's about the faithfulness when no one sees you, the tears that are cried, the prayers that are prayed, the small acts of obedience and faithfulness that lead to the fruit and character that then becomes a blessing to other people. And that's something we all have access to, to have those moments of faithfulness. Okay, so your new devotional is called Unstuck. 90 Days of Inspiration, Encouragement, and Promise of New Life. And this is a companion to your book, You Gotta Get Up, Grab Hold of Your Life After Being Knocked Down, Held Back, and Left Out. Where can people get your new devotional? Because it is out, I believe, this week at the time of this airing. So where can people find your new devotional and learn about everything you're doing and keep up with all your fiery pep talks they need? First of all, thank you so much for having me. What a delight. I'm so proud of you. And thank you for being a world changer. But you can get my books, all of them, anywhere books are sold, Barnes and Noble, Target, anywhere. Or you can go to Amazon. I also have the audio in both of those on Amazon. Or you can go to my website. Did you read the audio? Yes. Oh, get the audio, friends, because let me tell you, when the author reads it, they are fiery. They are excited to have Kim in your ear. And then you can listen to it when you're on a run on the go. You can't make excuses. They don't have any time to sit down and read. You're too tired. You just listen to it in the car. My audio is actually a bestseller before my book even came out. I had to get up. Yeah. I believe it. Women, women are busy. We're busy. We got, I, I listen to audiobooks all the time because think of how much I'm in the car, carpool line, putting on makeup. You're getting all that in your mind, just like you've been talking about. But it's not about. the same with the author. I, I have a hard time, maybe because I'm ADHD. I just can't listen to somebody that ain't wrote that book. I need passion. I know. I know. I, know. I, I got to tell you, when I wrote uh, one of my very first books, uh, Business well, Business Boutique was my first book. It was my first audio book recording it. And I go in to record and they like changed some of the stories the editors did. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. I didn't say, I didn't say like that. I say like that, you messed up my life. <laughs> I was like, this aha moment. I was like, well, I'm going to say it how I would have said it anyway. Yes. I love that. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, Kim, you are a fire to be reckoned with. You are a powerhouse and you're just such a blessing to people because just like you talk about on your Instagram page, 
one of the things that we struggle with is our thoughts can get, we can get down daily. And so we need that motivation daily. It's okay if you wake up and you're having a bad day. That's why you have people like you, people like all these amazing speakers and preachers that are putting into your mind. That's what we're trying to do is help encourage you to get to know God get closer to him and get your hopes up again. And you have definitely done that today. Thank you so much for being here. I'm so grateful and so, so glad to know you. All right, y'all. Do you feel like you could just charge up a mountain right now? Because I do. I told you she is incredible and her fire for the Lord is just contagious. I hope so much that it built your faith, built your courage, and of course, built your hope. Thank you all so much for joining me for this special episode of Get Your Hopes Up. I love hanging out with you every Monday to help you get to know God, get closer to Him, and get your hopes up again. Be sure to share this episode on Instagram and Facebook so other people can get their hopes up as well. And then be sure to follow this Christy Wright podcast channel so you never miss a new show. Then I'll see you next Monday for another new episode of Get Your Hopes Up.